And there will be examples later that you may want to pull down. Uh, there is a repo. Uh, B. Besmanov, how to test web apps on GitHub. Cool. So who am I? So some of you may know me. I'm head of mentoring here, fourth year student. Uh, but professionally, I've been doing a lot of web development. Uh, all of my co-ops have been through Constant Contact, where I've just been doing web. So that's kind of where the nature of this came from. But that's kind of enough about me. So I want to know who you guys are. So show of hands, how many people would consider themselves beginner web developers? Uh, intermediate, advanced, uh, never touched web ever. OK, cool. I'm glad no one knows what a browser is. So this talk is kind of geared. Uh, it's not really an intro talk. I'm going to skip over some of the JavaScripty things that are going on uh, and just kind of assume that there's some background knowledge there. Uh, if you want me to explain anything, please just raise your hand. Uh, I'll uh, take a pause, get it going. Cool. So uh, today, tech list, what uh, technologies you may see on the web uh, that you're going to see in the next half hour or so. Uh, Ruby, both RSpec and Capybara. Uh, so this is kind of one of the aspects of testing that I'm going to be covering. Uh, the other is JavaScript. Uh, Framework-wise, you're going to see Backbone, Jasmine, and Jasmine jQuery. Uh, so obviously, some jQuery is implied. So let's get started. Jasmine, uh, JavaScript and Jasmine uh, is a According to their README, uh, Jasmine is a behavior-driven development uh, testing framework for JavaScript. So time out, buzzwords. What is behavior-driven uh, behavior development? So uh, BDD is just kind of a style of testing, uh, very Englishly English -y in the descriptions. So if I can zoom in on here, which may be difficult. Uh, one example, kind of the king of BDD is Cucumber. So yeah, there, were, there was a question earlier about sensitive pixels. I want you guys to see all of them. So uh, kind of just describing the addition feature as somebody who doesn't really know math and they enter two numbers into a calculator, uh, what should happen? It should give the result on screen. 50 plus 70 should be 120. So that's pretty cool. It looks a lot like English. You could hand that to your boss, your product manager, just anyone, some, and they'll probably be able to understand it. But some of us like JavaScript more than English. Yeah. So uh, let's move into the kind of JavaScripty world of BDD. So this is a snippet of a Jasmine file. So. you're expecting, what it should do. Uh, so this, obviously, um, just describes everything. Nice small little locks. Uh, as I say, the example lives somewhere. Let's take a look. Uh-oh. That's not a happy face. So what's going on? The D is for driven. It's supposed to be a TDD-style framework. So some people think D is for degrees, D is for done. There's a bunch of things D stands for. But in this case, D is driven. So if we go back and take a look, uh, this was after the implementation of that math module. Simple uh, absolute value function, green, happiness, hooray. So success. Uh, so there are some other pretty cool features of Jasmine. So as I said, this is going to be kind of a skimming introduction at first. But uh, so you have spies and clock management. Uh, so spies give you the ability to spy on a function and be James Bond. You can kind of say, I want to take a look at console.log. And then I want to see that it has been called and that it has been called with something in particular. So with this, you can do some pretty cool things. Again, um, I do have the example up, but it doesn't really show much. The code is here. Uh, it would just show the green success because function calls console.log. Yep. Uh, 
No. That was just, yeah. So it would be. I just decided on this approach. Um, maybe in the real world you want to test something. There's a large function which eventually calls console.log. So this, um, yeah, no real reason. So the other thing I mentioned was clock management. So somebody wants to set a timeout for a million milliseconds, which is 16 minutes. Nobody's going to want to wait around for that, especially in a test. So uh, same thing. You're going to spy on console.log to see if it's done. But there's an addition now. Before each test, you're going to set up Jasmine's clock. And after each test, you're going to uninstall it. And what this does is it provides some kind of time stop mechanism. So in this first example here, uh, wait and do for a million milliseconds, obviously, wouldn't have been called regardless. But if you move the clock forward a million milliseconds, it will have been called. So uh, this would be a passing spec. Uh, same thing down below. Uh, this one may have a chance of actually completing. Uh, one millisecond and one instruction might be a little bit of a race. So, uh, But in this case, because you set up the clock above, uh, done will never, or console.log will never have been called until Jasmine's clock has uh, con uh, processed the tick, which is done manually. So on top of Jasmine, there are a couple other frameworks, et cetera, uh, one of them being Jasmine jQuery. So it's an additional set of jQuery-friendly matchers. So uh, this, so Jasmine already has a lot built in to be to match, to be truthy. So you kind of have this large suite to begin with, but then there are things that kind of look ugly with just those. So what looks more like English, expect element, so elem adder checked to be truthy or expect it to be checked. So that's kind of the problem that uh, Jasmine jQuery is trying to solve. So an example of a test using Jasmine jQuery, uh, same thing. Since we're using jQuery, there's a button. We click it, and then expects you to say, why would you do that? Because it's a big red button. So uh, something neat with this example, though, uh, if you notice, if I refresh the page, it does show in the upper right there uh, that something is happening. So Jasmine is actually triggering that event. Uh, since the DOM element is on page, it will fire appropriately. Uh, but that's not a full hard set rule of Jasmine. If you were testing this with kind of a conceptual button, it would still operate properly. It just wouldn't display anything. So let's dig a little deeper. We kind of have this framework now of how can I test something? But what do you want to test? So Backbone.js is a kind of a framework. Uh, here's again the description from their website. Uh, kind of buzzwordy. But it's more simply, it's just a client-side MVC framework. Uh, kind of provides uh, the concept of a model, a piece, an object, a collection, which is a group of those objects, views, which is what's displayed to the user, and then it kind of works with those. So a collection contains models, a view can contain collections and or models, so it can print out whatever or show to the user whatever is there. And here's where I fail a little bit with uh, Reveal CK. Uh, I was working, I was trying to type out this example, put it in, and then the markdown renderer just started stripping out content in the code. So it's a little weird to see from this angle, but so this is Okay. 
So let me know if you can't see this. But uh, so a simple backbone example is defining some kind of student. And every student, on top of being a normal backbone model, having some kind of attribute, uh, a couple different methods provided uh, through backbone, it also has procrastinate because we're students and that's what we do. Uh, just prints out a message to display a single student, which is what one of those lines is, uh, define a view that it takes uh, some kind of model, it templates it to that particular string, name, year, and then a procrastinate link. Uh, defines an event that says if you click on a link, uh, procrastinate, and then kind of the meat and potatoes is rendering. So it will take the model, convert it to JSON, and then throw it back at the template function. And that's why you can see there's a bunch of names, their year level, and uh, link to procrastinate. So a collection of students is just made up of students. And then the uh, collection view, when you want to show the entire collection, comes out of uh, loop through each student, uh, create a model view or a student view, append it uh, to the unordered list, and then you get everything. So here's just the example that uh, generates it. So a bunch of uh, random fake data. You can uh, declare a student by itself. So their name is Joe Schmo, their fifth year, add it to the collection, and then just display everything. So does anyone have any questions on that or? So how would how did the algorithm work for the collection function? So the collection uh, when it renders pulls each individual student and renders each individual student. Uh, and then that the specific template uses the underscore templating language. Uh, kind of looks like ERB in a sense with the percent equals, but uh, you can specify other template formats as well, uh, mustache, handlebars, etc. Cool. So, I was talking about Jasmine. I was talking. Test for it. It's the connection. So, how would you test this example app? So, for a student model, just create a student model, make sure it can procrastinate. So the procrastinate is just a call out to log, and then it shows that the right string is actually printed, not just that console.log is called. Uh, same thing now, but with the views. So this is where Jasmine jQuery works its way in. Uh, create a student model, uh, render it, render that student, and then make assertions about what should come out of that. You should be working with a list item, et cetera. Name should have the person's name and year, uh, which were template values, et cetera. Um, so another cool thing you can do, uh, and I haven't shown it yet with any example, but before just saying spy on console log uh, was actually taking away console log. If you had a console open and ran the test, there would be no output. So Jasmine allows you to write uh, call through uh, on, as well as like call fake, etc. just kind of different ways of working with that data. So cool. A little bit quick, but uh, we went through some JavaScript testing. Uh, before we move on to Ruby, anyone have any questions? Yep. Uh, Jasmine does provide support for that. Um, I've only worked with uh, Jasmine 1.3. They are on a newer version now of 2.0, and I know some of the APIs changed. But uh, you can specify that I have this uh, asynchronous block of code, run it, wait, 
um, which is kind of a weird handle latch function thing. And then you can say, run the, the rest of this test. Yep. Well, I had a question about six. So when, when you were showing us six and you did like simulate a thousand ticks, yep. anything between zero and a thousand would happen or just always a thousand? I believe it executes everything between now and then. Uh, I haven't actually worked with that specifically, though. Cool. So let's talk about Ruby. <laughs> Paul's excited. So. Uh, we started on JavaScript, we're making our way to Ruby. In the same vein, we started on Jasmine, we're making our way to RSpec. So RSpec is another uh, BDD framework uh, for Ruby. So same thing, same kind of function. Describe my math module, describe things about it, expect something to, ha to be true. So yeah, this doesn't have the nice little matcher of be greater than, so you kind of have to work within the framework. So there are examples of this, uh, but they are in the shell. So I'm going to switch over there. Assuming I could, there we go. So uh, for this example, that was in just plain old RSpec. So my math module, Again, simple, absolute value. But then the uh, spec helper. So convention is you define a, a uh, file that just brings in all of your test dependencies. And then the actual spec, again, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So Capybara, just like I started with Jasmine and then moved to uh, Jasmine jQuery, started with RSpec, moved to something on top of RSpec. Uh, so Capybara helps you test web applications by simulating how a real user would interact with your app. Again, this is from the uh, README. So that's pretty cool. There's other ones that like uh, other frameworks like Selenium. I know a lot of people have at least heard of that in here. So that's another interaction with the browser that makes it feel like you're working from the user side. So writing a test for something like that uh, allows you to visit a URL, and a browser pops up. You can click things and uh, expect things to happen. It's a real browser session. So I'm going to go back to the shell for a second. So, uh, so you can run RSpec by uh, RSpec and then a test file. So RSpec presentation spec. So this is going to be a little bit meta. I'm testing my presentation. So pretty quick. Uh, it was just doing a few simple assertions. Does the link on the intro page go back to the repo? And when you use the right arrow down at the bottom, does it switch sl slides? Not really a test for me, but kind of just a smoke test. Reveals uh, JS does work, in case anyone was wondering. Is that a... So, so then. So I'm using a few of the RSpec kind of helpers here. So let allows you to specify a memoized uh, kind of function. So I'm saying let URL be that, let what the repo link is. So it would be the equivalent of defining some constants. And is this all done separate? So it does spin up a browser instance. Uh, since I say use by default uh, Selenium WebDriver. However, you can specify, uh, and there are ways of getting it to run in headless environments. So that's pretty cool. If you have like a Linux box, you can still run tests. Um, so that's kind of like in the phantom JS realm of things. 
And I have uh, done that kind of. I was on a project where that was being done, which was pretty neat because I could run a VM onside my old computer, which wasn't really set up for that kind of development. Had a VM running, didn't have to worry about setting up a browser devoting like two gigs of RAM or anything. It was just running like a 512 Ubuntu server install. Cool. So we have these tests. We're all good, right? That's it. We're done. Go home. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I have you a little bit longer. So uh, what might be concerning about some of that test? The test knows a lot about the page. If you noticed, I was saying, this is the selector. Click this selector. Click this link. It's kind of scary when you think about it. Because what if we wanted to extend the test suite, add some negative cases, just anything on top of what we already have, copy and paste. Now something's changed. The selectors changed, the link text change. What happens? It's not good. <laughs> so page objects. So a page object is an object-oriented wrapper around a single element, be it the full page, be it kind of a widget within something. Maybe you have a text editing portion of your application. It knows specifically about that text editor. So what does that look like? So it, here I'm just creating a Ruby object to kind of represent this page. There's the content of the slide. There's the navigation bars. Uh, you can't see it since the nav bar is hidden, but there's a what slide you're currently on. There's kind of all this information that you can get at uh, if you want to query the right things. So this kind of abstracts it all away and encapsulate it, encapsulates it. So it knows that the content of a slide is, it's, is found by this selector. If this were to change later, say instead of in a section, it's now in paragraph tags, one place fixes, uh, updates all the tests. So how would that change the test? So same as before, knows about the URL, visits it, but instead it creates this slideshow object. Uh, and then you could ask things about that slideshow. Is it the first one? You don't really have to know how to find the first one when you're writing a test. You just need to know that you can find that or that it's provided to you somehow. So. Uh, this provides, uh, as I said, encapsulation, a consistent interface. Maybe you were checking first because there was like a thing on the bottom left that said first. Scenes, update the test uh, object, the page object. You don't have to worry about it. So putting it all together. This is actually going to be an exercise left to the reader. So now you know about uh, general uh, testing of JavaScript uh, files. You know how to interact with the page via Ruby. Um, and Selenium kind of has a library for every language. If you can write in it, there's a Selenium library. So uh, just kind of my words of wisdom to close this thing all out, some unsolicited tips. So. Uh, both of these frameworks were behavior driven. So think about what your tests are saying. Uh, ask yourself, are they English? So can you hand your output to somebody and it makes sense? Uh, couldn't really see it, but the um, formatting of RSpec and Jasmine, it's like, here's the first thing you described, here's the next thing you described, here's the next thing. Maybe it's a little bit of broken English, but does it make sense? Finally, can somebody, can you hand them your test input and have them know what's going on? The page object should be pretty easy to read by somebody who's familiar with the application. You should be able to hand that off. Somebody who doesn't write code should be able to say, oh, look, you're going to this page or clicking this button. Not some weird, crazy CSS selector dot click. So that's all I have. But does anyone have any questions? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, wait. Yeah.
I don't know for sure. 